For as powerful of a tool as night vision is, it still has limitations. Seeing the world in monotone shades of lightish, greenish, bluish, gray is pretty awesome, but it's often difficult to detect or identify objects at a distance due to a lack of contrast and resolution. Thermal imaging devices, on the other hand, excel at detecting potential targets, and they can also give you a lot of information about your surroundings. Night vision lets you see in the dark, but thermal vision lets you see the world in a very different way, and it can even be useful during the daytime. This video will serve as a primer on thermal imaging devices to lay the groundwork for more thermal content and device reviews in the future. We'll talk about the different types of thermals, how to know what you're looking for when choosing one, and how they can be put to use. First, what are the broad differences between thermal and night vision? Night vision devices can be analog or digital. Analog night vision is the distilled essence of a Lovecraftian elder god infused into a wafer made of tormented human souls. It's staggeringly difficult and expensive to manufacture. Digital night vision is basically a camera with the infrared filter removed and the ISO cranked way up. Analog night vision is black magic. Digital night vision is a broken camera. Thermal devices are all digital. They have a sensor like a digital camera, except it reads radiant heat instead of light. And that means they're basically just thermal cameras, although not all of them are capable of recording. Some of them don't have onboard storage or SD card slots. This means thermal devices have similar disadvantages to digital night vision and most cameras. When compared to analog night vision, you should expect more latency due to processing and a less true view of the world, even on supposedly 1x devices, because you're looking at a camera viewfinder. It helps if you don't think of thermal and night vision devices as trying to fulfill the same purpose. Night vision devices are good for movement. You can walk around or drive a car using head-worn night vision. Thermal devices are better for detection. As far as shooting goes, night vision is better for fast, reflexive, close-range shooting, whereas thermal is better suited towards more accurate, longer-range shooting just because of the types of optics you're going to be using. The last substantial difference between thermal devices and night vision devices is the cost of entry. Night vision devices have been getting more expensive over the last 5 to 10 years, whereas thermal devices just keep getting cheaper and more available. It's relatively easy for companies to make thermal devices, so it's relatively cheap to buy them on the civilian market. So how do thermal devices work? And no, I'm not going to try to give you a lecture on how a micro bolometer works because I don't actually know. I'm talking about how they work for the end user. A lot of the times when you're talking about thermal, you have to use terms like detection range versus identification range. Detection range is just the maximum range at which the sensor can tell you that there is something there generating heat. Identification range is when you can actually tell what that object is. Detection and identification range are largely influenced by the resolution of the thermal sensor. Typically speaking, more expensive thermal devices will have better sensors and longer identification and detection range, but the lenses and the base magnification of the device can also make a difference. The image produced by a thermal imaging device is based on a temperature gradient. All you're really seeing is the temperature differential of the different objects in view of the sensor. One nice thing about thermal imaging devices is that you can use them no matter what the ambient lighting conditions are. They work just fine in the daytime, they work just fine at night, they work fine in a pitch black cave. The downside of thermals is that it's still possible for two very different objects to have the same temperature and thus appear like one continuous object on screen. For example, in the desert, a person and a rock are both warmer than the ground around and behind them. So they both read as hot relative to the terrain, and that can mean it's impossible to tell the difference between a person and a rock if they're not moving. One of the other big limitations of thermal devices is that they're not very good at terrain detection. Night vision devices and your naked eye both get a lot of clues about the rise and fall of terrain because of light and shadow. Thermal devices don't see that, so if you have a large continuous patch of similar terrain at a similar temperature, it's all going to look pretty flat. The upshot is that out of doors, the different material composition of different items on the ground will absorb and radiate heat at different rates. So after the sun goes down, rocks, gravel, and pavement will all stay fairly hot, whereas vegetation will start to cool off. That contrast gives you a lot of information to work from, and you can navigate pretty well. That doesn't work so well in an indoor space where everything has had a chance to equalize to the same temperature over a long period of time. Trying to use thermals to navigate in a pitch black indoor space can be extremely difficult because everything looks exactly the same, although it does mean that any potential target will stand out very sharply. Thermals also don't see through walls or glass. I think the walls thing is pretty much just a video game idea, nobody really expects that to work, but they can't see through glass. That means you can't use thermals to see into a vehicle or a building. Most thermal devices can be switched through a bunch of different color palettes, which are basically just different ways to visualize the temperature gradient on screen. The classic ones you're familiar with from all the video games are white hot and black hot, which are exactly what they sound like. 
A lot of devices will also have color tinted palettes, rainbow style palettes, and sometimes palettes that have a white hot plus some sort of an additional color used for the peak sources of heat in the image. Another thing to keep in mind about thermals is that they have big lenses with large apertures, just like a lot of night vision devices. That means they have a very narrow depth of field and you need to adjust the focus if you're going to be looking between something near and far. Thermal devices also have to periodically do something called non-uniformity correction, aka nuking. That's just a periodic recalibration of the thermal sensor whenever it gets overloaded. Some devices will do it automatically on a timer, some will do it periodically based on whatever criteria the sensor seems to think is appropriate, and on some of them you can disable the automatic nuking and it'll just wait for you to tell it to recalibrate. When a thermal device nukes itself, you'll typically hear a click coming from the body of the device, and the image will freeze on screen for a second. And the last general quirk of thermal devices, at least that I can think of right now, is all of the ways in which they are like digital cameras. That means most thermal devices have a lot of menus to explore and settings to mess with. They can be a little bit non-user friendly compared to a lot of night vision devices, which you turn on and hold up to your face. This goes double for any thermal scopes that have a reticle system. Thermals, like digital cameras, are also power hungry, and you can't expect to get more than a few hours of battery life off of most of them. Compare that to the baseline of night vision battery performance. You can get 20 hours out of a lithium AA on a PVS-14. Some devices will do 40 to 60 hours on a CR-123. Night vision devices can easily go all night on a single battery. Some of them can go all week. Thermals, on the other hand, chew through batteries, so you kind of have to use them sparingly. All right, up next, let's talk about the different categories of thermal devices. Thermals come in many different form factors. One of them is dedicated thermal scopes, or thermal weapon sites. Thermal weapon sights can be magnified or unmagnified, but typically even the magnified ones have a very low maximum magnification relative to what you might expect out of a traditional rifle scope. Thermal weapon sights tend to have a very steep learning curve because they have tons of menus you have to delve through in order to zero the damn thing. A lot of them also go overboard with reticle selection because, hey, it's digital. They can project whatever reticle they want on there. How do I get out of this menu? Oh, scenario outdoor. Outdoor scenario. My scenario is outdoors today. The only problem is, yeah, you just need, you need an IT department to help you set up your thermals. The next category of thermal device is regular old monoculars, although these can be either handheld or wearable. Handheld monoculars are, again, often magnified, but usually not very much. Wearable or helmet-mounted thermals attach to a helmet similar to a night vision device. You can also sometimes bridge them together so you have a thermal on one eye and night vision on the other eye. Helmet-mounted thermals are not very good for navigating in darkness. At least, they are not anywhere close to as good as traditional analog night vision devices are. There are also two categories of clip-on night vision. Usually when people talk about clip-on thermal, they are referring to a thermal device that attaches to the rail in front of your scope or just attaches to the front of a scope directly. Dedicated thermal clip-ons don't work very well as monoculars because they have a screen and rear lens assembly that is designed to work in conjunction with a scope, not with your eyeball. There are also wearable clip-ons that are often referred to as Cody's clip-on thermal imagers. These are wearable devices that clip onto a set of traditional analog night vision and project a thermal overlay onto the image you receive from the NV device. It's kind of like having a thermal heads-up display on your night vision. So which kind of thermal device is right for you? I have no goddamn clue. We're going to have to talk about that some other time. Instead, let's talk about how to evaluate the performance of a thermal device on paper so you know what you're looking for when you're shopping around. The big number to look at right away is the resolution of the sensor, which is often given in pixels. Don't confuse that with the resolution of the display or the eyepiece, which is also given in pixels and is often significantly higher. The resolution of the sensor is such an important component of the image quality of a thermal device that it's oftentimes included in the name of the device. Thermal device manufacturers like to be a little bit cheeky and name the devices based off of the horizontal resolution rather than the vertical resolution. If you were raised on terms like 720p and 1080p, that can throw you off a little bit. If you were raised on the more modern bullshit marketing term of 4K, well, then you're probably going to find yourself right at home. Because, yeah, 4K refers to the horizontal resolution of a display, not the vertical resolution, and it's also rounded up from 3800. That would never have flown back in my day. Another important stat of a thermal device is the refresh rate given in Hertz. You almost always see 25 Hertz or 50 Hertz these days. There were some older thermal devices that had like a 12 and a half Hertz refresh rate. That would have led to a very laggy, flickering image. 25 Hertz is significantly better, and 50 Hertz is probably as good as thermal will ever really need to be. Given that most thermal devices still have a pretty long latency, a super fast refresh rate wouldn't do all that much for you. 
Another stat you'll often see on thermal device spec sheets is the pixel pitch, given in micrometers. This is basically the spacing between the different pixels on the sensor, therefore the density of the pixels on the sensor. A lower number means the pixels are closer together, and that theoretically leads to a finer image quality. Thermals also have a stat called NETD, Noise Equivalent Temperature Difference. A lower NETD number is better than a higher one, but these are often not listed by most manufacturers. There is also some inverse correlation between pixel pitch and NETD that I don't fully understand, and since I can't find really good numbers for most devices on the market, there's not a lot I can do about that. The last important stat to look for on a thermal device is the base magnification rate. Since thermal devices are basically cameras, any adjustable zoom you get out of them over the base magnification is going to be digital zoom. Past a certain point, digital zoom is almost less than worthless. It's like trying to take a picture of an overhead airplane using your cell phone camera. If you zoom in far enough, you'll get four gray pixels that fill your whole goddamn screen. Just to put it into practice, we're going to break down a few of the model names of AGM devices and take a look at the stats. AGM is not the only name in thermal devices, obviously, but they were willing to loan me some thermals for this video, so that's what we're using. The names of most AGM thermal devices have a two-letter prefix, which tells you what kind of device it is, followed by the lens diameter and then the resolution. So TS is thermal scope, TC is thermal clip-on, and TM is thermal monocular. The first number is the lens diameter. Generally speaking, bigger is better, and that's why they cost more. The number after the hyphen is the horizontal resolution of the sensor. Again, bigger is better. Let's pick two devices with extremely similar names and extremely similar on-paper specifications to compare. One of them, the Rattler TS35-384, and the other one, the Adder TS35-384. As you can tell from the naming scheme, these are both thermal scopes with the same resolution and the same lens diameter. If we delve into the stats, we find that the adder has a finer pixel pitch, so in theory should have slightly better image quality. We also see that the adder has a 3x base magnification rate versus 2x for the Rattler. That should result in a longer detection and identification range. AGM only rates it as an additional 50 yards for the Rattler. I'm not totally sure how accurate those numbers are anyway. There is a huge difference in form factor between these two devices, but since they use basically the exact same sensor, they have basically the exact same performance. The Rattler looks a lot more like what you'd expect out of a thermal weapon sight. The Adder looks more like a traditional rifle scope, and it also mounts into standard 30mm scope rings. These look so different from each other that it's almost hard to imagine that they perform pretty much exactly the same. But that super long body of the Adder scope doesn't have any glass in it. The sensor is still all the way at the front, and the LCD screen is all the way at the back. The traditional style of scope body is just filled with batteries and electronics, and makes it so it's a little easier to mount the Adder onto a traditional rifle scope. The form factor is ultimately going to be the thing that determines which of these scopes is better for a certain application. The Rattler would be a lot better for mounting on an AR flat top. The Adder would be a lot better for mounting to an old school bolt action. Why is this so difficult? <laughs> I don't get it. One trade-off is weight. The Adder weighs a lot more than the Rattler, plus you still have to find some scope rings or a scope mount for it, so it's going to end up significantly heavier as an overall system. The upshot, however, is that the long tube of the adder means there's a lot more room inside for rechargeable batteries. Hidden inside the tube are two rechargeable 18650 batteries, as well as a slot in the top for an additional CR123. All told, that gives the adder 15 plus hours of battery life, versus less than 5 hours for the Rattler. That's a pretty significant difference. The adder is a scope you could use all night, whereas the Rattler is probably only going to last about half of the night before you need to charge it up. If you remember from earlier, thermal devices take a lot longer to boot up than analog night vision devices, so it's not something you're going to want to be turning off and back on all the time. Alright, we should probably try to wrap this thing up. So, should you get thermal or night vision? Well, they both have their advantages, and neither is definitively better. Thermals and night vision complement each other very well, so you're probably going to want to get both eventually. I think it's probably better to start with night vision and then supplement it with some kind of thermal device later. Thermal by itself isn't going to accomplish as much as night vision by itself. I think you'll get a lot more enjoyment and use out of night vision, unless you're shooting pigs every night of the week. Shooting with thermal devices at the range is very difficult. It requires a lot of setup and is not very enjoyable. It's much easier to shoot with night vision, and you can also find other interesting ways to enjoy night vision. If you're only interested in detection and shooting, and you don't care about night hiking or driving under nods, that sort of thing, then the lower cost of entry to thermals might make it a more attractive proposition. I know thermals are awesome in Texas because you can use them to shoot pigs basically whenever you want, but in the rest of the country, it's often not even legal to use thermal for hunting in the first place. 
If you just want to add some kind of thermals to your inventory for tactical purposes, my recommendation would be to get an inexpensive, low-resolution handheld monocular. Even the low-resolution thermal devices have extremely powerful detection capabilities. You could get quite a lot of mileage out of a PVS-14 and a small, cheap handheld thermal. Whether you're moving around or in a static position, periodically sweeping the area with thermal can give you quite a lot of information you're not going to get out of your night vision device. Yeah, I do see you. Anyway, I hope this gives us a good foundation to work from as we go forward and talk more about thermal devices and using thermal devices in the future. Thank you for watching, guys. Let me know if you have any questions, and stay tuned for more thermal shit coming down the pipe. See you next time. Turner. Turner, take your girlfriend and get out of here.